Welcome to everyone who's just joining. We're gonna give it a few minutes for everyone to trickle in. Welcome to everyone who's joining. We're just giving it a couple minutes. Um, I know that joining the Zoom webinar uh, can take a minute. So just giving everyone a minute. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and kick us off. Welcome. Um, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, we're really excited to share more about Creativity is Boundless, an inclusive guide for supporting immigrant, migrant, and undocumented artists with fellowships, grants, and residencies. My name is Bethany Worden and my pronouns are she, her. I am the Director of Storyteller Support and Advocacy at Define American. I joined Define American in 2019, right as Define American, supported by the Kresge Foundation, was launching a fellowship program specifically for artists and storytellers who happen to be immigrants. This fellowship was imagined as a space for artists across medium, cultural, and regional backgrounds to gather and learn from one another and from experts in their fields to continue to develop their professional and creative practices. But we have never wanted to be the only opportunity available to the storytellers in our fellowship. We believe, like all of you in the artist support field, that artists need an entire ecosystem of support in order to thrive and flourish in their careers. And we see this program as just one small piece. When we asked alumni of this fellowship and other partner artists how we could continue supporting them outside of the fellowship program, the answer we received over and over again was a request for a resource that they could share with other fellowship, grant, and residency programs who were maybe less aware of some of the specific needs artists of various immigration statuses face. As an arts administrator, this was a need I recognized. In previous positions supporting artists at various organizations, I only learned how to process grant payments for immigrant artists myself, and especially undocumented artists, because a few very generous artists took on the extra labor of teaching me how to do it. They shouldn't have needed to do that work, but I also wasn't sure who else to ask. So we decided to create this resource together. This guide was compiled in collaboration with the Undocumented Filmmakers Collective, the Undoc Plus Collective, and individual artists and advocates. And I'm very excited to have some of these collaborators joining me in conversation today. So if you'll help me welcome them. Set Hernandez is a filmmaker, community organizer, and co-founder of the Undocumented Filmmakers Collective, whose roots come from the Philippines. As a queer, undocumented immigrant, they dedicate their filmmaking to expanding their portrayal of their community on screen. Set has just released a new seven-year feature-length documentary, Unseen, which is already winning awards on the festival circuit, by the way. Set's work has been supported by the Sundance Institute, NBC Universal, Ford Foundation, Open Society Foundations, among others. Welcome, Set. 
Mario Torres Torres is an indigenous filmmaker and organizer born in Mexico. Mario migrated to the U.S. at the age of six, an experience that has shaped the stories they tell. Now they are pursuing a career as a film producer and sound engineer, and are also currently a leading member of the Undocumented Filmmakers Collective. Welcome, Mario. And our final panelist today, Diego Sanchez, is the Director of Policy and Strategy for the President's Alliance, leading the development and implementation of the legislative and administrative policy agenda related to undocumented students and other immigrant populations. He is an immigration lawyer with over 10 years of experience in strategic advocacy for immigrant justice, including experience in state and federal immigration policy. Diego's passions for immigrant justice and access to education stem from his personal journey as an undocumented college student and former DACA recipient. Welcome, Diego. And um, Jose Antonio Vargas was really looking forward to joining us today, but unfortunately fell ill this morning and couldn't make it and sends his regrets. So we'll have to share this conversation with him later. Um, I'm gonna ask the first question to our panelists, but before we get started, just wanted to let everyone know that we'll be taking questions later. So feel free to add them to the Q&A box and we'll get to them at the end. Um, and if you hadn't had a chance to download the guide yet, my colleague will share that link now as well. So to kick off the questions um, for the whole group, this is a question for each of you. Um, why the need for this guide? Um, why did you join the collaboration process in creating this guide? Um, and why do you think the field needs it? And Seth, we'll start with you. Thank you so much, Bethany, for convening us together. And I'm so honored to be here with Mario and Diego. And thank you to all the attendees for being interested to discuss this matter to begin with also. Um, I think uh, often artists who come from certain marginalized experiences, marginalized for lack of better words, because I also hate that word. It assumes that we're not powerful, but we really are. Hence this guide with Bethany, you know, but I think like often, you know, artists who come from particular identities are like what Bethany said, we have, we're, we're being forced to not just be an artist, but also to have to be an organizer and an advocate. So we can't just focus on our creative work and it takes us away from, you know, the other pursuits that we have to really craft harness our craft, uh, if you may. Um, so I think having a toolkit like this, a resource guide that we can easily refer back to, you know, can really educate um, different partners so that, you know, artists moving forward won't have to advocate four times as hard, you know, because we're still going to have to advocate for itself, but maybe, you know, one less thing to worry about. I think that's where I'm coming from. I hope that's the outcome too. Mario, how about you? Yeah, definitely listening to the community and first off, uh, I'm super grateful to to be sharing space with all of you um, and super grateful for the folks that are here listening. And, you know, I think this, uh, this guy is very important, right? It comes from necessity, like most inventions do. And <clears throat> honestly, just kind of piggybacking off of what, what Seth mentioned, right? Um, creating is no easy task and putting it out in the world is no easy task, right? And then um, having to think about how we're going to find funding and how we're going to sustain ourselves, how we're going to thrive in, in this economy and in, in the situation that we're all in um, is already difficult enough. So I hope that this guide can can really give uh, ease and uh, create some relief for, for our artists. I like that word ease. Um, I think that is what we're looking for all of us <laughs> is that these these processes don't need to be difficult. And I think oftentimes um, we make them um, unnecessary hurdles in artist journeys, um, which actually ends up affecting the administrators as well, that they're having to manage all these really complicated processes when they don't need to be that way. How about you, Diego? Why did you join this project? Well, I think to kind of piggyback on what you said is that there are a lot of unnecessary hurdles right in this process and I think that's mostly because there are a lot of misconceptions about the legal requirements that you know eventually lead to programs not being open to applicants you know with certain um, immigration statuses 
So this, you know, eventually leads to artists having less access to both paid, unpaid fellowships and project funding, et cetera. So the guide can provide clarity, to, you know, to support programs funders. Um, you know, the, the, the reality is that uh, organizations have the ability to adapt these internal policies, you know, to make the fellowship grants, et cetera, more accessible to immigrants and undocumented folks. And this guide can help do that. I will say as a lawyer in the room that this guide offers general information, but does not constitute legal advice. So for specific examples, there are specific questions that you'll have, please consult with a qualified attorney. <laughs> Thank you. We very much appreciate that. Um, and the attorney that we consulted for this guide was Diego, too. I didn't mention that at the top. Um, so I'd like to start with you. Um, congratulations again. Like literally moments before we got on this uh, Zoom, we found out you'd won yet more awards for Unseen. Um, it was a seven-year production process, um, which is incredible and I'm sure also very tiring um, and I would love to hear a little bit about um, your process of looking for funding and support for this film project. Um, what were some of the areas where you found barriers and what were some of the places where you found open doors and um, support? Bethany, you're so generous as always. I just want to just say thank you for all that you do for the community. Um, you know, I think um, to your point and what we just responded to earlier, I think the challenges that undocumented artists face is, I think, being being undocumented, having been, having been undocumented for most of my life now, the experiences of being undocumented, like the challenges of being an artist was pretty much similar to my challenge as an undocumented student also. You know, like being able to go to college, looking for work, being excluded from those opportunities. I think the experiences that, that artists experience is not unique just to artists, but if you're living the undocumented experience, I think that's a cons consistent exclusion that we just faced in this system. You know, I also want to name that I think aside from, you know, beyond being undocumented, like I think being a person of color in the film industry or being in the art community also is already difficult. Add to that your immigration status, having a disability, you know, being trans or non-binary in particular, you know. So I think for me, what I came, what I, what I became good at doing in the process of looking for opportunities in the beginning was look like was reading uh, rules and regulations for every opportunity. You know, I have to read the fine print to ensure that I was even eligible to apply, and even when I read in the criteria that I'm not eligible, I go through the extra length of reaching out to the email address or the contact person listed in the program so that I can verify with them whether I am indeed eligible, letting them know my situation and asking them, I see that you have this you know, criterion. Is there a flexibility that you can um, implement in this situation, considering that my experience and other undocumented artists' experience could easily fit into all the other criteria. It's just this one bullet point, really, that removes us, you know. So I think, you know, inevitably in the course of when I started making Unseen, we also didn't realize that it was going to be a feature length film, maybe. Pedro and I were just filming, you know, and I think sometimes that's the magic of, of, things that happen spontaneously you know like yes there was an intention to film and get it distributed but there wasn't uh an expectation of what kind of film it would be you know so I think along the way when we were trying to apply for funds the first five years it was just me and Pedro you know both undocumented and being excluded from a lot of different resources so at some point, it's easy also to feel like ah this film's never gonna get made you know so inevitably I realized that I was not the only person who was going through these challenges. Other friends who are also undocumented filmmakers, turns out, were going through the same thing. You know, so leaning into my organizing roots, that's how we ended up co-founding the Undocumented Filmmakers Collective, because most of us were facing this block, this blockage to be able to move forward with our projects. You know, so I think part of it also is that a few years ago, there was no 
acknowledgement or there was no awareness that undocumented artists even exist. You know, I think especially in the film community, our lives are often portrayed on screen, but we're often just deemed as subjects of the story, but we're never thought of really as, you know, the storytellers behind those films, you know. And, you know, Jose Antonio Vargas, you know, was one of the, like, really, I think, important um, catalysts to highlight how undocumented filmmakers are creating our own stories, you know, and how can we, you know, make sure that there's space for for the rest of our communities. And I think that's where the Undocumented Filmmakers Collective really, really started. And maybe just to, you know, to to cut the story short, I think aside from that, it was also really important that there were other organizations in the film community, particularly community, uh, filmmakers of color-led organizations that were advocating, you know, to make sure that white filmmakers are not always the ones with the resources to tell stories of any kind. You know, I want to give a shout out in particular to organizations like Firelight Media, um, the Asian American Documentary Network, Visual Communication, Center for Asian American Media, you know, the Woodstock Film Festival, which also was instrumental to help uh, bring our film to life. I think the funding, aside from the funding also, there's the artist development programs, which I think you all kind of like discussed in an earlier webinar. I think the it's important to recognize that there's a spaces to get the funding. And then in my experience, there were also the spaces that didn't give as much funding, but they gave the space, the community, um, to be able to really sharpen what kind of story you're trying to tell so that you'd be ready to apply for funding moving forward. I think, you know, just because a program does not have funding does not make it irrelevant. But the unfortunate thing is that often even those programs that don't give funding may have citizenship requirements. For what? Who knows, you know? So I think like that's really where this conversation becomes really important, you know, and I think, you know, and the last thing I'll just say is that this whole um, ecosystem, this industry, for lack of better words, this field is very relational. So unless you have an opportunity to enter one room, you won't have the opportunity to enter other rooms. And I feel like for undocumented filmmakers and filmmakers of color, it's like all those doors are like locked, you know, and there's always a bouncer that's, you know, you know like keeping us away. You know, so I think making opportunities like this would allow us to grow as artists, but also build the relationships we need to advance in our artistic journeys. Thank you for sharing just a snapshot of that very long journey and the twists and turns along the way. I think um, one of the very exciting things that came out of all of that, aside from the film, was the Undocumented Filmmakers Collective. And it's a relatively young organization, but has already seen a lot of impact. And um, Mario, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about what the Undocumented Filmmakers Collective is doing and how they're expanding opportunities for immigrant artists and what changes you've already seen and what changes you hope to see. Most definitely. And, you know, all of this work would not have happened without filmmakers like Set. Um, Rocky Hassan, uh, Lorian Gomez Pestaña, right? Some of the uh, founders or the original founders of the Undocumented Filmmakers Collective. And yes, we are relatively uh, young in our in our journey, but uh, we have some amazing folks that um, you know have great organizing backgrounds and really know how to move in in this field. And you know, and we're just figuring it out, right? Uh, but we've been able to work with with Sundance. We've been able to work with uh, new uh, New Orleans Film Festival. Black Star Film Festival, Philadelphia Film Festival, uh, Woodstock Film Festival, um, just to name a few, to remove some of their citizenship requirements, right? As Seth mentioned, why do you need to have these requirements, right? Like, why why do I need to prove uh, my existence or why do I need to prove that I am valid in, uh, for you in order to give me an opportunity, right? Like, I, I'm a human, I'm an artist, and I'm putting these things in the world, right? And I think that should be more than enough. I don't, I, I don't think that any artist should have to jump through these many hoops, right? But that's exactly why the filmmakers, uh, the Documented Filmmakers Collective came about. Um, just trying to find community. Uh, there's a lot of needs and in, in specifically in, in filmmaking. And as ben, uh, Seth already mentioned, right? Being undocumented, being a person of color, um, there's so many hoops and so many journeys. And so that's just some of the work that we're doing. And, 
And what we really hope to to do at, uh, with, the, with the collective, right, is not only expand these opportunities, but create our own opportunities. Um, in the beginning of the year, we launched our second iteration of the Screenwriters Fellowship, right? Um, last year was our first one. And then this year, we had the opportunity to... Um, um, yeah, we had we had the opportunity to to onboard a, a new member who is actually um, who was previously deported, but um, is you know trying to figure out his way back into the country and just his status. But all of that to say is right. Uh, we're talking about a person who was completely ripped from their home once, and then twice with deportation, right? And now they're left in limbo. But instead of uh, pushing him away or telling him no, you you can't be part of the screenwriters fellowship, right? Regardless of his situation. Uh, we welcomed him and and we did the work that I believe a lot of these um, grants and fellowships should be doing, right? Figuring out how can we include these folks? How can we, and you know, let, we, we can talk about, you know, we'll, we'll center it back on onto this guide and, and here in the US, right? Like how can we really uh, be transformative in the way that we provide these opportunities to, uh, to artists and to filmmakers, right? Because at, at the end of the day, um, some of these uh, opportunities are the ones that, give us the, the stepping stone onto, you know, or a, a launch pad to our careers. I love that. So the Undocumented Filmmakers Collective is both doing external advocacy, but then also nurturing filmmakers um, as a collective. Is that is that what I'm understanding? Exactly, yeah. We're working inside and outside and just trying to, to create a whole new ecosystem. I love it, I love it. Um, Shifting uh, a little bit, um, curious, Diego, what are some of the common challenges that you hear about that immigrant artists are facing in accessing fellowship and grant opportunities? Thank you, Bethany. And I'll focus on some of the more the legal aspects since Seth and Maria provided some other great examples. And I think the, the biggest one is, is just encountering the unnecessary and, and emphasis on unnecessary legal eligibility requirements. So Seth gave uh, a great example of someone who, despite uh, some of the confusing legal requirements, uh, Seth reached out to the program to ask for clarity, right? But the, the reality is that many of the applicants looking at these applications are just simply discouraged from even inquiring about the program and, and even checking to see that if whether there's any discretion with eligibility uh, policy. So, and this is not just about the citizenship requirement, right? But also there are some requirements that specify that work authorization is required, right? So when it says applicants might, must have work authorization in the US. Uh, so, yeah, generally people with DACA to PSTD and, and other statuses have work permit. But when when um, applications include that type of language, it's just unnecessarily exclusive. So because there, there are folks that working in the U.S. can apply for an individual taxpayer identification number or ITIN or work as an independent contractor, you know, there, there are other exclusive uh, other eligibility requirements that, that are exclusive, right? So normally I'd, I'd recommend that in the rare cases where there is a legal legally justifiable reason why an, an artist support program could not fund projects by immigrants in the U.S. So for example, I can think about programs that are tied to federal funds, right? Or, or state issued funds, right? I would recommend to just include a reason for that exclusion in the eligibility requirement, just so that you also show that you put some thought into this, right? That, th that there is an exclusion for a particular reason. And there, like I mentioned in the beginning, there, there are misconceptions. For example, a big one is that immigrant, migrants, undocumented artists just cannot be paid, right? Receive stipends, receive grants, uh, which is why some of the opportunities just ex exclude some people. So many of these support opportunities, you know, the stipends, grants, uh, what have you, are, are not considered full-time employment, right? And that's where there's some confusion by some of these programs. And artists would not be required to fill out a Form I-9, right, asking for an employment uh, ver eligibility verification. In most situations, only in a form W-9, which is a request for a taxpayer identification number, the ITIN number, right? And anybody 
uh, so the item is a tax processing number issued by the IRS that can be applied by anyone who is who's not eligible for a social security number, regardless of, of an immigration status. So artists without a social security number can complete these documents with an item, and then they would operate as a sole proprietor, right, with an un unincorporated business. And then on, on the other side, so some artists choose to establish a limited liability company, some other business entity, like many folks that we know have, have done, in which case they can receive payments directly to that business instead of, you know, uh, as an individual. So although I do want to clarify something because there are some concerns um, out there by employers and, and other programs that, yes, employers may not knowingly hire un unauthorized immigrants, right, thanks to the 1986 Immigration Reform Control Act, right? Federal and state laws do not require proof of immigration status for someone to go in, you know, for an individual to go into business with themselves and receive payment for goods and services they provide through an LLC. So I just want to make that clear, right? Um, so there are no laws, immigration, tax, otherwise, that prevent an undocumented immigrant from lawfully forming and owning a business in any state. So in other words, owning a business is legal and being paid for that work through that business is also legal. And there's some, some also some confusion that receiving scholarships, fellowships, grants, Sometimes people say, well, is that compensation to an employee? Are those considered wages? They're not, right? So they're not the same thing as wages, salaries, compensation to employees. So public charities and, and private foundations are not required to ask for information about the immigration status, social security number, or work authorization for grantees, right? And that's something that happens a lot in, in D.C. Uh, that we're dealing with. Everybody in D.C. that you meet is a consultant. You know, they're independent contractors. So it's it's very normal, uh, very normal out here. Thank you so much. Really, really appreciate that perspective. Um, I think one of the things that we hear from a lot of um, maybe smaller nonprofit organizations is that they don't have access to this kind of um, legal consultation or don't know where to find it. Um, and so they make rules out of fear instead of out of knowledge. Um, and one of the reasons that we created this guide and have this panel today is to supply some of that knowledge and dispel some of those fears. Um, I'm curious, Set and, and Mario, in your experiences as artists applying for programs, what are some of the misconceptions that you've come across um, when, when you uh, find a program that um, includes an exclusionary um, requirement in, in for applicants for eligibility. Um, what are, and you've reached out and talked to them, what are some of the common misconceptions you hear? I, I think Seth might have a better uh, understanding of this since, you know, he's gone through the process a lot more than, than I have. I'll go ahead then, Mario, and then if I miss anything, please do um, fill in the gaps as always. Um, I would say, oh, where do I begin? Um, I'm like not naming names, holding, biting my tongue. But I would say one of the most interesting interactions I had, interesting for lack of better words, um, was, you know, with this organization. I think, first of all, maybe the challenge too is that some of um, these philanthropic organizations or these funders, you go to their mission statement, you go to their values proposition on their website, and they're like progressive, you know, like we're supporting immigrant artists, blah, 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 blah. And then you reach out to them asking for support as an undocumented artist, and you yourself was directly impacted is excluded you know so i think the fact there's a hypocrisy maybe just naming it you know that that i've experienced you know with different philanthropic organizations um so i think the the misconception one of the misconceptions that i've seen is you know an organization saying like we have, we're a 501c3 um if we pay you we might jeopardize our tax situation whatever you know i should also say that for Unseen, we have received funding from 15 different philanthropic organizations. I don't know how many of them are 501c3, but we received funding from 15 institutions. You know, they figured it out, you know. Um, and I think, you know, how can um, 
I think the other misconception too is that folks don't realize that there's other people that are doing this kind of work, you know, and, uh, you know, being, being um, isolating, you know, one's, um, one's self from the reality that there's an ecosystem of, uh, of philanthropic um, institutions that are trying to change it for, um, for folks is also really important to consider. But yeah, I think the the biggest, the biggest um, one that the biggest misconception that I've that I've seen is where folks are worried that their fight that their um, legal structure as an organization they would be open to lawsuits, you know, for paying undocumented folks, um, which is not going to be always the case. I should say though, like uh, there is what Diego was saying. There are organizations that do get funding from from you know federal organizations i think it maybe it doesn't hurt to name it like for example pbs it's funded by it's funded by you know viewers like you which are taxpayers you know of the, the us the us government strangely also undocumented people are taxpayers you know but all that all that drama aside the reality is because it's funded by the federal government to my understanding that's where the limitation of getting funding becomes you know really it it makes sense to a certain extent and how can we shift you know the opportunity so that artists who are also you know you know contributing to that pool of money whether it's taxes or other ways can also be eligible for that um, i don't know if maria wants to add anything else yeah i think i just want to add a little bit to the uh, to the ignorance portion of it right i think in the last session we mentioned it briefly um and just mm, for whatever reason, whether they're scared, they might lose the status, or they just, it's easier for them just to put these clauses in there just so they don't have to do the work, right? I feel like some folks are, sorry, some organizations, right? They're just ignorant to the situation and they just choose not to do the, the extra work, right? And so that just really begs me to ask the question of like, who are you including and how diverse are you really, right? Because at the end of the day, if you're saying that you are wanting to be inclusive, of, of different filmmakers and different artists, yet you're not willing to do the extra work, right? Being undocumented doesn't mean that you don't have a green card. There's like a whole different array, a whole spectrum of, of statuses, right? And a whole different spectrum of, of how to find funding and how to get paid. So, so I just wanted to, um, to make that point, right? And remind folks, sometimes we do have to do the extra work, especially when we have made a commitment to the community. The community looks very different. So we have to find different ways of, of working with them. Thank you. Um, I'm curious, Diego, and not to put you on the spot, but if you would want to respond to the fear that SET has heard from organizations that are concerned about losing their 501c3 status due to supporting um, immigrant artists through grants or fellowships, is that something that you've heard? Is that something you've had to respond to? So in the general sense, and this is this is very common. So this is the same issue that 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 we encounter when when people simply want to hire. So we were working on an in-state tuition campaign to defend in state tuition in Florida. We were trying to figure out how we can hire some organizers that were undocumented, right? And some organizations, right, especially the the larger ones, the more established ones that have you know, their general counsels and have, you know, attorneys on the board, they normally, you know, would would be freaking out even to hire people as independent contractors. So it is very normal, but the reality is that, like I mentioned before, it, it's legal for someone who's undocumented to open an LLC and provide services that way. There's nothing, you know, that there's nothing illegal about that. And, you know, programs can do that. That that's the most common way that undocumented folks have been providing services and goods for, for many years. Thank you. Um, on the more positive side, um, I'd love to hear about some programs that you think are doing it well, that are um, actually being inclusive of immigrant applicants and artists, um, and some good experiences that you've had um, looking for grants and fellowship opportunities. Would you like me to start off, Maria, or do you want to go first? Oh, okay. I'll take the leader. <laughs> um, I would say, um, 
Hmm. How do I say it? Um, part of me is like, can I name names and would they be okay with it? But also maybe to a certain extent, it's okay. Maybe because in my bio that they put on their websites, I say that I'm undocumented. So you know what? Let me dive in. Um, I guess what, what one one space that I would uplift is, for example, the Open Society Foundations has multiple fellowships. You know that um, are open to undocumented are are open to everyone. You know, regardless of their immigration background. Um, I would also say. You know, I think that's like the funder side, like the big, the big bucks kind of, you know, funding, Um, you know, some of the funders also that work with the Undocumented Filmmakers Collective, I think might also be a good place to reach out to. And I'll let Mario speak more about that. I think on the programs that have artist development plus funding, um, I named it earlier, but Firelight Media, I think has Firelight Media actually is a very good example because when my mentor, Sonia Childress, was running a program there that I applied for before I was even like, you know, officially doing filmmaking, they had a they had a restriction actually on immigration status. So what I did is I emailed Sonia, whom then I did not know personally yet, you know, and they actually removed the, the status during the process of receiving applications from folks. You know, so I think just because a certain eligibility requirement exists at this moment doesn't mean that this cycle, nobody who's undocumented should be able to apply, right? So I think Firelight Media in particular is a really, really great example of intentionality, artist support, um, and all of that good stuff. Thanks. Yeah, and, and just adding on to that, you know, I think um, to, to your point set of, uh, you know, naming some names, uh, you know, I think they're they're very clear about the work that they're doing. Uh, Center for Cultural Power, they have their Disruptors Fellowship. Um, I think that's doing an amazing, uh, amazing job, right? Um, they really take care of their artists and they put the artists first. Um, also with their Beyond Status, right? Their Beyond Status program, uh, which centers undocumented and immigrant artists, right? Um, who literally just want to tell their story, who have a t story to be told, right? So they focus more so on, on the individual, on the artists themselves, rather than project-based, right? I feel also a lot of these programs um, focus more so on the project rather than than the artists, right? So I really wanna highlight them. Um, also um, during the pandemic, right? A lot of negative things happened, but a lot of, a couple of good things came out of that, right? Um, Sendence Institute partnered with the National Endowment for Humanities. Um, Firelight Media, I believe was also part of that. And so they gave, 20 uh, under-resourced, underrepresented artists, you know, unrestricted funds. So it was great that they, that they did that. Um, I think the only caveat is that it's not a, a continuous or it's not a sustainable uh, uh, practice yet, right? So that's what I'm really hoping to see in, in the future from some of these organizations to provide these unrestricted funds uh, to really take care of the artists so that they can create and they can put these narratives out in the world. Thank you. I also want to shout out Undocu Poets, which has been supporting undocumented poets for many years now, before actually any of our fellowship programs in this group here. I um, want to shout out their work as well. Um, we're going to open it up to questions in just a minute. I have one more question for all of the panelists. So if you have any questions for the panel, feel free to add them to the Q&A now, and we'll get to them in a minute. Um, my last question for the panelists is one for each of you to answer. If you could advocate for just one change to the way grant, fellowship, and residency programs are currently structured, what would it be? And Diego, I'm going to let you go first. Sure. Thank you, Bethany. So I think all of us mentioned this one. And it's basically to be more inclusive. It's as inclusive as possible in the eligibility requirements. I mean, they unnecessarily just exclude people. And the reality is that most organizations can you know, adjust their funding eligibility policies, even to explicitly state that the artist support opportunity is open to all applicants who are living in the U.S., regardless of immigration status, right? So I know in the guide, um, there's one that says, open to all residents of the U.S., regardless of immigration status. There's one that's even better that says we welcome applications from U.S. citizens, legal permanent residents, and it specifies all the different um, statuses. So that's 
you know, someone who's like, I don't know, a refugee or, uh, you know, uh, uh, someone TPS where DACA can say, okay, you know, I can apply, you know, it's not as confusing. And, you know, this is similar to the trend in job applications where employers, spe you know, specifically invite folks who identify as BIPOC, right, Black, Indigenous, people of color, LGBTQ+, and, and so forth. So that that would be my main one is just, you know, make make the eligibility requirements as inclusive as possible. Set, would you like to go next? For sure. Thank you, Diego, for naming that thing. I would say, I think, um, sorry, I'm reflecting on the question. Uh, maybe because we only get to <laughs> ask, we only get to share one. I would say, I think the citizenship requirement situation is one symptom of like more fundamental issues around exclusion, you know, in our field, you know, so if I only I can only share one, then I guess I'll go, you know, to the very fundamental, you know, I think like exclusion that we really experience. And like I mentioned before, you know, I, I recognize that it's important to focus this moment to the experience of undocumented folks and, um, you know, also lifting up that filmmakers with disabilities, you know, trans and non-binary filmmakers in particular also experience a lot of exclusion, you know, uh, refugees, you know, um, folks that have been deported, people who were formerly incarcerated, especially also. I think, you know, artists from these communities are also often excluded. And I think there's this idea, there's an elitist idea of how artist programs are run. You should have come from a certain pedigree, come from this school, gone to film school, whatever, whatever, you know, and I think how can we how can we really reframe the values of creating these funding and artist programs where we're not always making people we're we're not always forcing people to have to prove their worth to be able to have access to opportunity because if we don't have access to an open door we'll never get an access to the room itself you know the garden behind that room you know so i think you know this um the citizenship requirement is like just the hinge to the door you know let's let's remove that door is what i'm saying thank you i love that let's remove that door mario how about you yeah i, I really like that too let's let's remove more than one door right um i think so um those are very two beautiful points uh and it's really difficult right to like narrow back to one without kind of repeating exactly what they said but um as i was thinking you know I think also uh, age requirement, right? I think there's a lot of artists that come into this country um, later on in, in their life. And, you know, they're aged out of a lot of these programs. And who who am I to tell someone you're not an artist because you're above X amount of, of numbers, right? Of years. Um, I was, that recently happened to me by like two years. I'm, I'm 28 and, or three years, right? I'm 28 and the cutoff was 25. So I, I was a little disappointed, but just like Seth did in the past, he he reached out, he asked question, um, and they said yes, go ahead and apply. So I applied, and I'm currently waiting to see if, if they accept my application or not. Yes, thank you for calling that out. I I think that it's the the ageism piece is a problem across the arts world. I think, and I think taking into account. Um, the age that someone might have moved here and the extra time it may have taken them to establish their footing financially to branch out into something like the arts, um, the amount of time it might have taken to even figure out the programs that are worth applying to, like all of all of those factors um, are going to mean that not everyone is 18 when they're starting on their artist journey and and making more opportunities available to those that are starting a little later in life with more stories to tell. The only thing about getting older is you get more stories to tell. Um, and so, yeah, I would love to see more openness around age requirements as well. All right. Um, we've got a couple questions here in the Q&A. Um, here, we'll start with this one. If I'm currently run running an arts program that I think has exclusive language, what immediate next actions can I take? Is there someone I can talk to? This is a great question. Um, 
And the guide has some suggestions for language that Diego shared. Um, but also, if you want to talk through it more, um, Define American is always happy to meet with you. Um, you can reach us at fellowship at defineamerican.com, and I'll add that um, to the chat so you can have it. Um, as Diego mentioned, we can't offer specific legal advice, but if you're just needing help brainstorming language around something, we're more than happy um, to help with that. And if you are looking for um, help specifically with an undocumented filmmakers program, then I also highly recommend the Undocumented Filmmakers Collective um, to reach out to as well. All right, next question. Um, do you think these programs are intentionally excluding undocumented folks or are they more just not even aware? I'm going to let our artists um, answer that question. Set and Mario, what do you think? I, I think it might be a little bit of both, right? Um, going back to the funding and where the funding is coming from, right? If it's coming from, um, from the federal uh, sector, then yes, you know, there, there's some reasoning behind that. But I think it, it more so comes down from not knowing or not wanting to do the work, right? It's just really easy for folks to to put language together and sometimes put it up on their website and they don't even know what it means, right? Um, so I think I think that's a that's a huge part. I'm not sure if you have anything to to add to that set. Yeah, I think or, you're right. Or Diego. <laughs> I was gonna no, say. I, I mean, I, I... go ahead, Diego. No, I, I think Mario covered it. I mean, quite honestly, and thank you to this person who asked that question, right? Because you're intentionally showing that you want to be inclusive. Um, I, I think it's just not knowing, right? Not not realizing that, you know, that you're excluding people, right? I don't I don't think, you know, most organizations do it, you know, willingly. Um, it's just, you know, a lack of knowledge a lot of times. Yeah, I... 100% agree with both of those answers. Um, as a current and former arts administrator, I will also say the dirty little secret is there's a lot of copying and pasting that happens. You see what another program is doing and you don't know how to write eligibility requirements and you just borrow someone else's. And I think that there is sometimes intentional exclusion, but I think also sometimes there's just people not really knowing what they're doing and or what language means. Um, and I've had some conversations with artist support programs that didn't understand that when you um, require um, an applicant to be a legal resident, that that doesn't just mean someone who literally resides in this country. They did not understand that that is like a legal immigration designation. Um, so I think that there's a whole range of reasons. Um, and But I do think that finding knowledge and um, finding organizations or um, immigrant ad advocates that can help you figure this out is really important. All right, next question. Um, festivals or film organizations that do not have fellowships, grants, or residencies, but want to support and include more undocumented artists, how can they use this guide? Asking this question considering the field of the ecosystem, the field's ecosystem. I'm gonna pass that to you, Mario, from Documented Filmmakers Collective. And then you cite, go ahead too. Go ahead, Mario, I was gonna... I Sorry, I'm rereading the question. Please go oh, ahead. Okay. I was just going to say, um, I think part of it, you know, whether you're in the exhibition side, distribution side, or whatever, I think the, the, the film in particular, my experience is that it's so opaque. Like, folks don't talk about budgets. For, folks don't talk about peer, uh, pay equity, you know. Um, folks don't talk about how they get distribution, you know. And, and it's just so much opacity. How do programmers program films? You know, like there's no room for feedback often. I think, you know, part of maybe where one area that I, I'll speak for myself, I think that it could be really helpful, even if you don't have an artist program that you're running, is that if you are aware of this of these issues and you know that your colleagues in another organization might have, you know, like be more conservative for lack of better words and how they're approaching them, like really really um push them you know like be okay with being a little bit uncomfortable i think i think this is where allies can be really helpful and co-conspirators 
you know, because I think it's so unfair to expect undocumented filmmakers to always be the ones advocating for ourselves, you know. And of course, that's not to say that we're not powerful because we are amazing. We've been advocating for ourselves for a long time. Sometimes, though, we just want to sit down and water our plants, you know, and uh, like let somebody else, you know, like do that heavy lifting, you know, especially if you're in a position of power. Um, I think that's where I'm coming from. Yeah, just, just echoing what Alitza just mentioned, right? Sharing knowledge, sharing power. I think that's super amazing. And um, that's one of the best ways that festivals or film organizations can can use this uh, this guide, right? We're sharing some of our power with you. We've taken um, years to come up with this information and, you know, um, within a couple of months, put it all together in a beautiful guide. Um, and so, yeah, definitely use it, utilize it, study it, right? And then go back and and show the community that you can actually you know that you're able to receive this information right and then go back and make the change go on your website remove all those eligibilities like just make sure like send out e-letters letting folks know like hey um we recently removed this uh, citizenship requirement or this legality requirement please apply right and that just really expands and just transforms the whole ecosystem Thank you both. Um, I'm gonna save this question for last and go to the next one, which is um, a great question. Can you talk about eligibility requirement that is framed in terms of emerging versus established filmmaker? Who is considered established and what is considered a successful film? For example, an artist might be an amazing creator on TikTok or YouTube, but may not have made a film that has been distributed in what is acceptable by industry standards. How does that play out in terms of barrier to entry? I think this is a really interesting question and I feel like it might relate to the intersectionality that um, Set and Mario were both talking about, especially in regards to ageism. Um, have you come across this distinction in, in things that you've been applying to and, and how have you positioned your work or um, your collaborators work um, when you're, you know, especially the first few times that you're applying for something? So I, I, I don't know about you, Seth, uh, but I would still consider myself an emerging artist, right? Um, it's really nuanced and it's really strange the way that different organizations, right? Because I think everyone has a different definition of like what is emerging, what is established, what is successful, what is not successful, right? I think um, Hollywood, uh, uh, just generalizing Hollywood, right? They would determine success based on how much money you bring in, right? But that's not really the case. I think uh, it goes beyond that. It's a, a transcending culture and transcending reality, right? Um, how much impact can you have on culture? How much impact, um, you know, can you create it within the narratives that you that you want to tell? For me, that's what success looks like, right? Even just being able to put out a, um, a one film, even if it's a minute film, right? Uh, a feature documentary, that's successful in itself. Um, so I, I, I don't know, so, um, what do you, do you have any, uh, any points to that? No, thank you, Maria, for sharing that. Yeah, I, I think every yes to everything that you've named about measurements of success. Um, in my experience, you know, I think folks are considered emerging, like if they have less than, if you have one or two feature length films, feature length films in particular that you've made, you're still considered emerging. You know, I think sometimes you have to have at least 10 years of experience to be beyond emerging to. That's the ways I've seen it framed, you know. Um, and I feel like I should also say that once you make your first film, it doesn't necessarily get any easier. Um, because getting your second I think to Mario's point about ageism, you know, when you get older and you you're trying to get your next project you know, off the ground, you're not that fresh, young talent anymore, you know, and, and you become less sexy to support, you know, for however sexy you are, you know, as a human being, like the, the, the support is no longer there, you know, just as much, you know, so I think that's kind of like the ways I've experienced this question about like, um, emerging versus established. Thank you both for those perspectives, super helpful. Mm. Um, and I do think this is a question that the whole field should be talking about a little bit more. I think another area that programs can give some more specificity is 
um, defining that for their program. So if they say it's for emerging or for established, give some parameters around what that means. Like Seth mm-hmm. was saying, is that a certain number of films that you've completed? Is that a certain number of years that you've been working in this industry? Um, I think that's another place that Clarity can really help applicants. Mm-hmm. Um, and Bethany, if I can yeah. just add a little bit to, to, yeah, to that ahead. point, right? Also being Also being flexible, right? Um, sometimes you're just like one film away or like one year away from being able to apply. So I think I, I, that's that's a big part of it too, right? Not being so rigid and so strict. Society and, and you know, where we live is already really strict and then this government, right? As to how they want us to, to live and how they want us to operate. As artists, we don't have to do that, right? At the end of the day, when, when we're the ones at the gate, then we're the ones that decide how are we gonna, you know, let more folks in. And for me, that it, that's what it's about right? Allowing more folks and giving more opportunities out. That's right. I love that. Thank you. (laughs) Uh, I think this is a great question to end on. um, And that is, how can we support the work of the awesome panelists here? Um, Do you have Instagrams you want them to follow? Do you have emails you want people to join? Is there some other way that they can be supporting you? Um, Mario, I'll start with you. Sure. So definitely follow us. Uh, we're pretty much on all social media platforms except for TikTok. We're not there yet. Um, but yeah, we we're on our website, you can pretty much find um, all, if not most of the information that you would be looking for uh, to get a hold of us on documentedfilmmakers.org, uh, on Instagram and uh, social media, we're on DocuFC. And I'll go ahead and, um, and tap, type that into the into the webinar or into the chat. And if you want to follow me personally, feel free to reach out uh, at Torres Torres Films on Instagram. How about you, Set? How can people support your work? Yes, maybe um, if folks want to check out our new film, Unseen, our next screening is at um, the Queer Women of Color Media Arts Project Film Festival on June 10th. And then we have more festivals in the summer that are yet to be announced until a couple of weeks from now. So we hope that you can join us. You can follow our film at Watch Unseen Film, uh, or you can visit us at unseen-film.com. And we want to make sure to uplift everybody in our filmmaking team, also many of whom are members of the Undocumented Filmmakers Collective. So if you support the Undocumented Filmmakers Collective, your support goes 10 times. So please listen to what Mario said. Great. And how about you, Diego? How can we support your work and the work of the President's Alliance? So the President's Alliance does not specifically focus on on artists, uh, but right now the closest thing that we have very similar to this actually is we are in the research process of figuring out other non-employment based opportunities, similar to grants, fellowships, internships, stipends that we can uh, implement at higher ed institutions, so colleges, universities, so they can hire undocumented folks. So that that's what we're doing at the President's Alliance and our website is, uh, what is our website? I always forget, it's press, presidentalliance.org. And then on Twitter, I am, even though I am reconsidering Twitter at this moment for some reasons, uh, at Diego and Sanchez. And, and thank you all for, for being very engaging. Thank you all. Um, Thank you so much for being part of creating this guide. Would not have come together without each of you. Um, Thank you for being part of this conversation and sharing so candidly about your experiences. Um, If there are any further questions that we can help with, feel free to reach out to Define American at fellowship at defineamerican.com and we'll see how we can help. Thank you all. Have a great rest of your days. Bye. Thank you, Bethany and everyone.